What is the one thing hip hop's taught you? If you think like, like if you could, if you could narrow it down, leaving yourself. Boom. That's, that's it. it. Listen, we are absolutely honoured. We've got DJ Semtex on the Jax Jones and Martin Warner show. Welcome to the show, my brother. Thank you. Thank you, man. Thank you for having me. It's an honour. Pleasure. Before we move on to the interview, I wanted to just touch on London quick because you've obviously lived in London a long time, Sam. And like, yeah. the, um, you've seen, I've just recently become a bit obsessed with those kind of YouTube documentaries talking about gang life over the years in London. Right. There's like a lot of amazing youtube channels where they're interviewing like old road man and yeah, yeah, and yeah, like yeah. uh it just it kind of bounced out of like how drill documents gang culture in the yeah. in london just on another level right yeah and the that for me that was the height of growing up you don't realize the paranoia you live in when you're living in london you don't even yeah, realize yeah. what you were experiencing and i wonder like it, there was a quote in it though and especially now you're in croydon i'm thinking about wood green how it used to be Someone yeah. said something in it where in about 20 years, they reckon that London's just going to be like have no gangs left because just basically they're flooding the capital with obviously and gentrifying it so much that there's just no pockets yeah. anymore for mm. that kind of stuff. Do you know what I mean? And maybe Wood Green might find a brighter day now. <laughs> I, d I don't know. I mean, my, you know, I never experienced the London gang thing. And, you know, I moved to London in like, it was like 97. And, Growing up in Manchester, the gang shit was a way of life. It really was like, yeah. And I, and I, I'm not a gangster like or anything like that. I'm not professing to but be. But you encounter it through the genre yeah. you're working in, though. Yeah, yeah. Because I was yeah. working in road rap like back yeah. then, like roadside. Not even the genre or, though. Not even the mean? genre. Like, like what you what what I found in Manchester was, like you grow. It doesn't even if you're in a nice area, it doesn't matter. You you you're related to someone who's in it, or you know someone who's in it, or your best friend gets caught right, up in right. it, and you kind of yeah. get into it. It's also very alluring. Like you know, it when, is, you see, when you see when you see your, your man then making like a grand a day shot in, and you're like, oh, is that all they're doing? Like it, you know, you yeah, can see yeah. how easy it is to get caught up. But in yeah. Manchester, it's like I found Manchester was a lot more respectful because everybody knew. If you were going to get in, even the nerds, if you were going to get into it with someone, just know that his cousin is from my side or just know that his brethren right. is Peter Mill or he's part of that crew or whatever. So everything was more calm and everything was more respectful. When I moved down there, I couldn't believe how it was down there. I was like, this is crazy. Like, And also with the clubs, when I first moved down here, I'd go to a club and there'd be one security on the door. I was like, this is a joke. Because like, <laughs> in Manchester, they used to pull the doors off the venue to get in and this, 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 that, and the other. Oh like, God. yeah, that, that's why I moved down there. I had to move. Yeah. If, if I lived yeah. in Manchester, I could never succeed as a DJ in Manchester because all the clubs kept getting shut down. All the gangster shit was, was seeping into the raves and everything. I, was, I wouldn't be who I am today if I'd have stayed up there. As much as I love it, but I, ha right. I had to get out. I had to move down there. So... I love it's, the journey, um, yeah. Yeah, but down here, the gang thing, I think because London's so big, you know, it's almost like two or three cities in one. Like, yeah, I like to think of Croydon as a city, separate it from is, London. Yeah. Oh, know? it totally is, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You've yeah, got yeah, your Westfields come in, right? Yeah, uh, I got to, you know, they tell everyone that, so you move down here. But it, it, it never <laughs> happened. I, I, got, I got told there's going to be a tube station, I got told everything, but... Is Manchester, I think, because it was so concentrated, like mm. you were forced to live with it. So when you're talking about gangs, I don't I don't know the history of London gangs. I can tell you in Manchester exactly who's related to who, who did what, what that firm's yeah, about, yeah, how that yeah. firm's not about no more. But it's is it actually had nothing to do with the music. Most people who was in it were listening to jungle, drum and mad, bass, mad. house music, they yeah. like you were kind of like a nerd if you like hip hop. Like I was like some nerd doing mixtapes. So you should yeah. hear about this new group it's called Wu Tang Clan, and they're like, they, <laughs> "That's crazy." Yeah, they yeah. they drive around in the whip, listening to it, like smoking and stuff. But their whole thing was like rave, like all them big raves that used to happen up and down the country and and dr mm -hmm. jungle and all of that. The real bad man listen to them kind of things it wasn't it wasn't hip-hop that's that. so different because yeah. yeah in over here <clears throat> in london at that time like it would have been early 2000s for me yeah it would have been it was just that archetypal route where you were selling drugs and then you use the money and make music 
you know, mm. as a as to occupy your time. And I remember at the time you had like PDC, and uh, I remember during the Choice FM, like uh, they used to have those rapology days and like yeah, in Croydon. Dynasty in Croydon yeah, 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 and yeah, yeah. all those. Oh, and you know, these guys were doing bits, and but then they would make music as well, and it was like, um. I was just very used to that just coming together. It's like rave culture didn't really hit me until I like grew up a bit. Basically in London, mm. it was rap still to me, mm. but man, I, I just find it mad interesting, man. But shall we get stuck in? You are in an amazing room right now. I've seen multiple plaques on the <laughs> wall and your yeah. DJ library is loving it. insane. There are CDs, right? Do you still play them? That's like a wall of Dizzy Rascal plaques for when I was touring with him, DJ with yeah. him for eight years. Um, did some amazing shit, taught the world several times over. And so these are like really, really special to me because it was like, for me, I think he's the most um, significant, iconic rap artist to ever come out of the UK. Like his 100. DNA is in everyone's raps today. If you if you listen mm. to Grime, he, he's like the primer, like he's the DNA. You can hear it. Even to the new Grime artist that comes out today, the way that they, they do choruses and the attitude and the intonation, yeah. it's all dizzy. It all comes from him. Like, so it's dope to be a part of that and, you know, and do some amazing things. These are all CDs. I don't use them. They're so tiny, but the booklet, all the information, the detail, the artwork, you know, back then, whether it was vinyl or CDs, the, the artwork was made to catch your eye. Now yeah. it's like, I don't, I don't think people give a fuck about artwork like they used to. I really don't. Oh, no. No, the attention to detail doesn't go into it. You know, they, they'd normally be months of planning and plotting to get the right photo shoot, to get the right art direction, to get the right illustrator or whatever. Now everybody just calls up someone who's on the ground. Yeah, can you do this fifty pound? All right, yeah, cool, let's go. And that's it. It's and I think, I think, it's that's because of the way everything's sped up. Like it's it's all streaming. Streaming is just it's increased. Fast, isn't it? Microwaves yeah. everything, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. For me, it's like. You know, I remember times in history through when records were released. I, I, you know, it, it's like certain points of time. Yeah, this happened when the Red Man album came out, or this happened when Kendrick dropped Section Eighty, or whatever, whatever, whatever. Oh man, yeah. So yeah. it's all important to me. And before I had this collection, I had a vinyl collection. I had like, I had like thirty thousand vinyls, and I sold them all because everything was getting bootlegged, so the value went down, mm. and then. You know, as as my family was getting bigger, it felt like it was a fire hazard. So I was just like, it, it, I really, I woke up one day and I was like, wow, I'm sat on like four or five tons of straight plastic. You know, if this Crazy. goes up in flames one day, we're all getting fried. So <laughs> I got rid of it, like started mixing the CDJs and everything. And then yeah. when I switched from CDJs to MP3s, it, it, it that obsessive collector in me transferred. I chased down everything and now I've got like 40,000 40, MP3s on my hard drive. So anytime I do a rave, it's a wrap. Like, I'm good. Any any DJ wants to rinse before me, I'm, yeah, it, it, all right, it's cool. I'm good. I, you know I'm going to ask someone who's uh, an obsessive music collector. This is a nerdy question. But when you're hitting the rave and you've got all that music, mm. how do you organize all of that, B? Yeah. Because you know you DJ yourself. It's like no, you, but I you know. struggle with that. To be honest, really, with you. yeah, right. it's just I've just got a lot. <laughs> it's 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 very. So I gotta give a big shout to Benji B. He said I've got the most organized music library anywhere. He's never seen anything like it because I think he lost some tracks one time. I was like, yeah, don't watch that. And I was like, on a rare occasion, I let someone look into my hard drive. Amazing. Everything's labeled like everything is radio edits, dirty versions, by the producer. I even do, you know, like playlists now do things through mood and, you know, they'll have work. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, I was yeah. doing, I've been doing that. I've been doing that for years. So in 2016, I've got, I've got like 30 different sets that I was tearing up 2016 with. And I can go back to that at any time. I've got that for every year. So whether it's hip hop, Afro beats, R&B, whatever, 2016, 17, 18, 19, 20 is missing because, you know. Yeah, obviously. yeah, yeah. It's a quiet one, that, yeah. <laughs> but but when, when you get used to documenting everything like that and having everything in them systems, you instinctively know what to draw for. You 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 know it just kicks in. So for me, it's like I just, I'm, I'm good to go. I'm good to mash up any rave. Like, it's fun. I love it. 
I, I, I've got it. I've got it. I'm, I'm going to write an algorithm for. I'm going to take your master copy and write an algorithm for <laughs> DJs. All right, press the fucking button, take ten thousand, forty thousand music, and give you all of give you all of this searchability. That's actually a good idea because it is. You could base a proprietary software off of the way Semtex organizes music. Of course. Music. That's the only a legit idea, <laughs> dude. I mean, just 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 by tempo alone, is is really really helpful, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and that must have taken you hours. So I'm just thinking of the time efficiency. When you get a track, label it properly, and then you're good. You just throw it in a list, and then through time, like say for instance, let's go back to Jax Jones 2016. You know what works for you on stage and what didn't. So sure. you just take out the shit that doesn't work and then the stuff that does work, that becomes the priority. And then it's like, yeah. You can get an algorithm to do that because you're relying on DJ's ability to select. You're relying on the DJ's ability to file things. You're relying on the DJ's ability to... Even use it at the right time and read the crowd because they all. It's, it still mm. boils down to whether that person is a good DJ or not. Yeah. Because you could you could give everybody. I say this all the time. You you could give everybody the blueprint. You could write it all in a book and show them this is how you do it. It still won't get it right. It's no. about you, you, it's about what you can do instinctively. There's only a few good DJs in the world that yeah. really really get it. That are in who touch. would you who do you rate as a DJ? Oh, uh, Jazzy Jeff, incredible. The way he makes oh, EZ's it. EZ's amazing, yeah. Yeah. It's like, one time I did a gig with... <laughs> one time I did a gig with EZ and Rodigan on the same bill, and I was coming on after EZ, and I was coming on before Rodigan. That was the most challenging set I've ever done. It's not even about the music you select. It's how you play it. It's how yeah. you entertain. It's how you build the momentum. So if I'm going to play a track, you got to burn through them quick. Like, it, hip-hop's different to, like, you know, EDM or dance music, whereas, yeah. yo, you, you guys can play a seven minute track. I can't do that. I, I know play... <laughs> hip hop mix is like 90 seconds, right? Not even 30 seconds, <laughs> like 30 seconds. You're moving quick. So yeah, you've got right. to have the pace. You've got to have the momentum. You've got to read the crowd. You've got to make sure, um, make sure you're tapping in to how people feel and how they want to feel. So you're predicting what the next four tunes, the next five tunes ahead. And I think with with EZ, the way yeah. he uses the tracks and the way he'll use a bass line or he'll use a vocal or he'll use a bit of it, like he, he he's he's a god, like when it comes to DJing. Rodigan Rodigan is unfair because he's as much an entertainer. It is. He's, yeah, he's, yeah, yeah, he's yeah. Because it's like he's almost done, you know, like actors. Great actors have done Shakespeare. You know what I mean? Great, yeah, great yeah, actors yeah, have spent yeah. time in the theater yeah. doing Shakespeare. He's like, that's like him. He's he's like that. He's he's because he's come up through doing the clashes and everything else, where it's all about performance and it's all about audacity and it's all about competing. That learning process that he had, that training that he had, and it's the same thing with Grime MCs, better than every other MC because they came up on pirate radio and clashing. When mm. you come up through that circuit. Uh, you can do anything. And yeah. that's what I'm saying. It's like, so with Rodigan, he's playing records. And, and let's, so what you were saying about the algorithm and music and everything else, he, he's the same mentally. He's, he's, he just knows rhythms. He just knows moods. He knows what to jump for. What to, what to, he knows what to select. He knows what to call for. But he's also entertaining and performing and working the crowd, regardless of age, demographic, gender, or anything else like that. Yeah. And I've seen him tear down a little shubs. I've seen him tear down um, a little after party. I've seen him tear down Wembley Arena. First time I met him was at Wembley Arena. I know, <laughs> and I was on before him. I just said to him, I don't want no smoke. I was like, I respect <laughs> you, innit? I'm just saying, like, <laughs> just so you know, I respect you. I want to do my thing now, but I rate you, innit? So, you know what I mean? <laughs> when you go on, just... Yeah. Oh, it'd be cool, you know. Yeah, and then, and then, and then I seen him tear down festivals. Obviously, you could get someone. You could record your playlist, and you could recall. Yeah, you know what you're doing. It's like, but what I, I'm getting what you're saying. What you can't do 
is if you think let's take the forty thousand tracks, right? Yeah. You can't you you can't easily figure out for every track exactly when in that track it's going to mix with the other track that you want and then you get down a level and then another level and you've now got millions of combinations just with 40,000 tracks so the challenge is how do you define at 1 minute 21 with track A to track B and you track because if you could get that then ultimately you'd be bringing DJ into a f***ing science right because you'd have the optimum opportunities and then you but then the question is even if you could get it how would you know what works on a night? I don't know if yeah, you, you know, you, you don't, you, just, you don't, right? That's the art, I guess. Yeah. You don't. That's I, a mean, challenge. I could turn up. All right. I panic before a set, right? If I'm not ready, I, 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 I'm a firm believer that preparation is everything, right? Oh yeah. If you're prepared, if your equipment straight, if you've got the right cables in the back, so you know where to get them from, you're going to have a good night. And even if I do like, I, right, let me do this playlist now of like, 20, 30 tracks that I'm going to play tonight, right? I'm going, to, I'm going to go in with the intent to play these tracks. When you step on stage or when you step in a DJ booth, that all goes out the window because <laughs> right. it depends on what they want. It depends on yeah. how good or bad the DJ before was done. So if yeah. it's a DJ, you you got, you got a lot of work to do. <laughs> it's, it's, a great, it's always great to go on after a DJ because you're just going to look even <laughs> greater than what you already are. But... It's like, then it's like emergency work. Then it's like, bring it back. It's almost like you're apologizing for that shit DJ that was on before. Yeah, and right. Sometimes I've been on, I've been on before when there was a shit DJ and it was so bad. I spent half a set trying to bring it back. It was so bad. They did such yeah, a yeah. Shit job. There was yeah. 20 people in the room. It was like, yeah. it was diabolical, you know? Yeah. And that person mm-hmm. got the booking because of privilege, because they knew someone who yeah. knew someone. That's why they got the booking. They should, I've never seen them DJ since, but. It's, it's like in situations feel, like are that. Are you it, talking about a specific person right now? Oh, come on. <laughs> no, I can't. You're teasing. I can't. I can't if I do that, I'd, I'd be... Really, uh, no, 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 no one to come on your show. you got to keep that down. It's, it's, it's not even that. It's, it's, you, know, you, know, you know what it's like. You get people who come into the space who are not really DJs and they come with a little CD pack or a little USB key and they try to look sexy on the decks, but really they've got no clue what they're doing. Yeah. It was one of them. And, and it, yeah. you know, you know, well done. Good luck to everybody trying to get paid, whatever. But at the end of the day, it was an insult that that person was on before me. Yeah, I hear yeah. that. You, you, and it you affects the lineup, right? Oh, of course, yeah, man. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, yeah. I think, though, that's the ebbs and flow of having a long career. Because yeah, you yeah, see yeah. that. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. You, you have those moments. Everyone knows when you've been in it for a while. Well, not everyone knows because no one gets to be in it for a while. But like, like yourself, where how long is your how long would you say your career is now? It's like, um, I started DJing in '92. That's a long wow. career, bro. So yeah, you would know yeah, yeah. where the peaks and troughs when you're brand new, and then yeah, you're the yeah, hot yeah. one, and then you're oh, just yeah, nice, yeah, yeah. and then you yeah, reinvent yeah, yeah. and all of that. Yeah, do you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, so yeah, 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 you get yeah, yeah. that. You do get that kind of like elder statesman discernment where you're just like, how the hell is this well, person on. on before me? And that well, was on. terrible. <laughs> Semtex is almost as old as, I think I'm older than you, dude, by about a year, I'm guessing, Couple right? A year old. or two? Couple of years old, right? But you, you were raised like me where you'd be in the car with your mum and dad and you'd be listening and you're like, Hip hop, well, first of all, hip hop wasn't around right in the eighties and the nineties. Then but yeah, rap yeah. came out, and all of a sudden, you felt uncomfortable listening to it because it was so new, it was so fresh. Like you, there was just pop. There were other things that we were listening to at the time. You know, a bit more of a band culture. You had to make that transition into it. So where did you start? You couldn't have started on rap. No, Michael Jackson. There you go. It's a great, great old pop, right? Yeah. My mum and I say that. I say that, like. As a kid, all I know is Michael Jackson because my mum, my mum, my mum used to play it. She used to play the Off the Wall album every night. You know, yeah. it was one of them like, yes, yeah, album. Kids to bed, and then <laughs> that's great. Your mum used, used to sleep. play Off the Wall while you were asleep. That's amazing. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Like when you're a kid, right? And I'm talking like when you're like eight or nine, you don't really appreciate music. You don't know what music is. You don't, you know, you don't appreciate the value of it and everything else. And you haven't yeah, got a yeah. clue what it's about to do or what it means. But it was like, I, I, just, I just knew, I know off the wall off by heart because of that, basically. So from that, and then it was my brother who got me into hip hop. My brother introduced me to it. So mm-hmm. it was like through him that I got into it. 
and then and it's, it's, you, you're right martin it's like i used to play run dmc albums in the house and obviously there's loads of cursing and everything else right. and my dad would be like turn that rubbish down but what that does it makes you want to turn it up yeah exactly yeah, you're just re- you're just rebelling against it, right? <laughs> oh, you don't like this? Okay, all right, cool. You know, so I, I mean, we're really excited to chat to you because you're clearly a connoisseur on this subject. You've got a podcast, and you've just written a book called Hip Hop Raise Me. Yeah. So I know what that means to me, but I want to ask you: Can you explain what it means when you say hip hop raise me? Um. Well, it's for a lot of different reasons, and I never really, I never really. I, re- I never even realized it until I, you know, I had the opportunity to do the book. And I, I wanted to do a book. I wanted to do a self-help book. I wanted to do something called Tragedy to Triumph, where... I love that. It, yeah, it, it cool was, name. I'm, <laughs> so I was like... You shouldn't have thrown that out there, bro. <laughs> no, nah, it's, out, it's out there. It's out there. Ah, ah, so you've written two books? No, 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 no. No, no, no. So this was the initial idea. So I was going to call okay. it Tragedy to Triumph. Yeah. And I was going to cover Kanye, you know, like he went through a car accident and yeah. then one of the biggest artists, 50 Cent, got shot nine times and they tried yeah. to wipe him out and now he's one of the biggest artists. What so biggest there's artist. a thread. So I thought, I thought it would be good to do it. I think it's, it's, it'll be motivational for the kids to read the yeah. stories in detail. And I was going to go in and get the, the, the medical records and this, 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 that and the other and everything else, even though most people know these stories. But the reason why I was going to do it as well, because I've interviewed all of these artists. So I've got mm. all of these stories anyway, in depth yeah, and everything yeah. else. So I was just going to go in and decode it more and everything else and all of that. So um, someone on you took, took the idea to a book company and the book company was like, no, 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 no. We want him to do the book on hip hop. And I was like, no, nah, I can't do that. It's too big. It's, it's, yeah. You need like a council of 20, 20 people to do that. Like, yeah. I can't do the book on hip hop. And then, so a couple of weeks later, like, I, I was I was very close to Macklemore at the time and Ryan Lewis, and I was, uh-huh. a, you know, still am a fan of them and everything else. So there's a there's a um, there's one particular track called "Can't Hold Us," which is incredible. It's like a, it's a festival. I mean, it's festival f- festival favorite yeah. all around the yeah, world. Yeah, 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 yeah. And and there's a line that says, "What do you expect when Wu Tang raised me?" Or what yep, do you expect? Yep. What do you expect when Wu Tang raised you? Yeah. And I was like, "Yeah, I was raised I was raised on hip hop," and then I was like. Yeah, I was raised on Public Enemy. And then and that's when I got the title. So that's I was like, I could do the book from my perspective because no one can argue with that. Nice. So whereas if you try to do the definitive book on any genre, you're, you, you're going you're gonna to get it wrong. There's something that you're going to miss out. There's something where you're going to be like, you got a little bit of detail wrong or whatever, whatever. But my perspective, that's yeah. my perspective, isn't it? So. It's such a, a provocative thing to say that hip hop raised me. And yeah. my relation to it, is because what i find interesting in hip-hop outside of a lot of genres especially what you're talking about what you touched on even from the tra- tragedy to triumph you get mm. these stories and within hip-hop you get role models whether mm. you know it whether you realize it or not especially for men i think as well mm. like you know i grew up with not many great male role models and within hip-hop mm. those are the people you looked up to so when you say hip-hop raise me that's what lingers with me Mm. Where what what does that statement mean to you outside of the book on a personal level? I mean, it is a hundred percent fact because you know through hip hop, learn about Black history. I learned about my heritage. I learned about stuff that wasn't getting taught in schools. So, you know, in Manchester, originally it was from an area called Cheetah Mill, which was multicultural mix. Mm-hmm. Then. When we moved to an all white area, Middleton, that's where I discovered the word nigger because yeah. they were chasing me around the playground calling me that. There's a game Whoa. called Catch the Nigger and Tag Him. I didn't know I was the Shut nigger. Up. I was getting tagged. Yeah. yeah. So so that's how I learned about racism. That's how I learned. And it was really it was really difficult because at from where I was and at the time and everything else, it was like I had no one to talk to. Like I was going through all of this stuff myself. Mm-hmm. And then you know, and even though you, you know, like you talk to your parents, but your parents, they don't tell you what you want to hear. Like, my mum's like, I'll just ignore it, whatever. And I get, like, I used to be angry at the time because you said that, but I get it now because her generation dealt with well, it. That's what they were taught. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. 
And it's like, and her generation, the generation before her, like they coped with things differently. So, mm -hmm. so I was like, nah, that I was, I refused to accept that. So, um, my brother introduced me to hip hop through Run DMC and Dougie Fresh and all of this mm -hmm. stuff. And from that, I found my way into Public Enemy, and that shit spoke to me. That shit is it told me about Malcolm X, Marcus Garvey, Martin Luther King, all of this other stuff. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't it it, it 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 really plugged me into a bigger world. Really plugged me into a bigger purpose and what we're here for. And then from that, I go to the first live show. Public Enemy. Mm -hmm. I see the way the posters are done, the iconography, the use of logos, the artwork, and everything else. So it was like it was all new. So you got a new sound, you got new imagery, new iconography, new artwork, and everything else. And the artwork had a message, like right. everything. The music videos had a message, and everything else. So everything within the music was hitting me differently. The artwork was hitting me. The mm -hmm. way that the groups worked the sonically, the way the music was made as well. It was it was taught like they say, bring the noise. It really is noise. I think there's there's millions of other kids like me that was raised on it, and they just went into different genres or whatever, whatever. And I think with the processes, the whole approach to business, the whole thing mm, about right. hip hop is always encouraged entrepreneurialism. You don't totally. get taught that. You don't get taught that in school. You don't you don't oh. get told you could be a boss and run your own company. You don't, right. you know, Why? they don't encourage that kind of thinking. It's just like, you know, I used to go to a careers <laughs> officer and I take the piss like, oh, what do you want to be? I want to be a film director because mm. I knew there was no jobs for it. And they'd be like, well, <laughs> no, 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 no answers. They had no answers. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, yeah. Like, you know, and, and I'm like, that's me. Can you imagine other kids who, you know, different and everything else? And it's like, so for right. me, hip hop really... It really did help me develop as a teenager and as a person. And, you know, everything that I'm doing to this day really stems from hip hop, the music, like the lifestyle, the whole approach, like I said, the business side of things, would you, the historical education, the whole thing. Would you say well, then it was not just a cultural reference for you, but it served as an education for you? Definitely. Right? Right, you, you. I mean, you, you weren't just taking stripes out of a book here. You were actually get gaining insights, whether it be entrepreneurism, right? Whether it be how to motivate yourself, how to in, be inspired about a different life that you could have. Because when I think of cultural references, I think that those are those are small elements, it would, uh, pockets of information. But education is something that's a little more sustainable. And what you're saying when you say hip hop raised with ultimately is that you gained a lot about life and how you wanted to live your life by listening to the music, right? And that's very powerful. So my question to you, my man, is like, what was the first track you ever bought? And then what was the first hip hop track that you listened to or rap track? So the first track that I ever listened to, um, Dougie Fresh and Slick Rick, the show. And, and the reason okay. why I remember that, because it, it was a record that, and it's been sampled to death over the years. It's one of the most sampled records. Like I think even man. Beyonce used it recently and everything else. And, you talking about Ladi Daddy? We no, no, that was on the B one. side. That, that was, was on the B oh. side. So, so Dougie Fresh in the show, right? Mm -hmm. And then today, even the way it's produced sonically is incredible. It could sit next to any record today, right? Mm -hmm. So, but what it is, most of the track is built out of beatboxing, right? Mm -hmm. So Dougie Fresh is one of the illest beatboxers ever. So I just remember my brother trying to beatbox. And I was like, what is he doing? Like, I was, what, what is, this is my big brother who I look up to. And I was like, what is he doing? And it, it was like it was like a cultural invasion. All of a sudden, one day he's wearing tracksuits, trying to beatbox, and this track, which bangs, is like, and him and all his friends are wearing Sergio Takini tracksuits and whatever. Oh yeah. And I was just like, I was just like, yeah, I was fully. That was my first experience, and that that really drew me in. First album I ever bought, there was there was three of them. It was it was three cassettes. It was Public Enemy, It Takes a Nation, and Millions. It mm -hmm. was Ice T the Power album, and it was BDP, um, by any means necessary, and it was like those are those are the first few cassettes that I bought. So, so that that was when I got into it myself, myself. Like my brother introduced me, but then when I got into it myself, myself, that's when I started collecting, and that's when it it was like I started just hoarding music. And going back to the hip hop raised me thing. Most of my best friends I've made in life today through hip hop. Yeah. I think in the way it caught me, it caught other people. 
and it brought us together it shows for me it's important to like the person i can't like they're like your older brothers do you i'm saying like you know just to touch on what you were saying about um the entrepreneurial aspect and those life lessons you get from rap it, i mean that touched me deeply because even the jewelry i uh, try, aspire to buy yeah, you yeah, know yeah, buying a presidential yeah. rolex or yeah, whatever yeah, it is yeah. that was yeah. that was what i saw jay-z wearing on yeah, the yeah. big pimping video on the source or do you know what i mean and that that jewelry is it, and all of that uh, those messaging is is that those mm. were the things that say yeah do you know what son you mean something now what attracted you to it martin mm. Where I mean, you're, obviously you had your ticking titan days, but you're not from the roads. Like, was it hard for you to connect no, to but, it, or was it like fantastical? You know, because well, obviously that speaks to the appeal of hip hop on like just yeah. how far it goes. Now, I'm glad you asked that question because it, it's everyone's journey through music. I mean, music is so important to everyone's life, and people don't often examine it close enough. But as I've often said, right, my dad introduced me to the broadest genre of music, right, and my son who Jax knows very well, has got this broad sense as well. I was so curious about discovering anything, but I was also curious about America. Oh, oh yeah, that's a big topic uh, for a British you know, man to say, yeah, yeah. All of a sudden, I stumbled onto this one track, you know, straight out of Compton. And then there's, you know, Bitch and the Police and everything. And what happened when I heard it, I'm like, first of all, I loved the start, the intro. And I loved, the bit that really gravitated me was, was Easy E's uh, part. And, and I thought, wow, this is fresh. And then I just wanted to hear more. And I was still cringing. I'm like, man, this is not just deep, but it's aggressive, <laughs> right? And the subjects were, were brutal, right? And, and West Coast rap was very brutal at the time, right? It didn't soften for many years. So it's kind of a, uh, in my own sense, a, a connoisseur of, of, of broad genre music. I'm like, I found something really fresh and new. And then I was trying to discover more. So, uh, you know, like you, like a lot of us at that time, lived through the era of, of the East Coast, West Coast rap. And as it evolved more into you know, mainstream hip hop, I just thought this was hard. I didn't need to see a movie about it for it to be still fresh in my mind in terms of that early discovery. It was just totally unique. And it just, I just gravitated to it. And then I wanted to discover more and more. And, and I thought I was a, a, a pretty early adopter of, 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 of rap because of, of, of that track. But I got a question for you. Just around role models, now I understand kind of that period you were through when you finished on De La Soul, these kind of early influences. But the two, the two points I've got for you, you can have influences, but who was your role models growing up or growing through this? And who would you say is a good role model today in hip hop? I'd say growing up, it was definitely... Chuck D, Public Enemy, it was um, DJ Premier from Gangsta because that by yeah. that point I started I started um, it wasn't see see with the hip hop thing it wasn't like it wasn't like I need to live my life like these people it was more of great respect like it was more about the purity of the art that's what I rated them for that's what I respected yeah. them for. Um, in terms of like role models, it wasn't it wasn't really that. It was more a more um I don't know, you know, it's a good question. I never really thought about that. There's no one where I'm like, oh yeah, you know, this person, da 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 da. And and you know, like the, the whole thing about, you know, people say about that being a negative influence and this, this, that, and the other. I've I've never shot or stabbed anyone. Like I've never owned a gun yeah. or whatever, whatever, whatever. And it was right. like, it was it was for me. I could always draw the distinction between what was real and what is entertainment, yep. um, what was bogus and what wasn't. Yeah. And then going back to what you were saying about ECE, you know, it I'd, I'd seen all the stories and everything and and everything else and this 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 that and the other. And it's like as you go on through life, you realize, um. What, what was happening and everything. But I think with with role models today, um, I think there's some pretty good ones. And I think the the two biggest, if we're looking at music at hip hop, the three biggest rappers right now, Drake, Kendrick Lamar, J. Cole, what they embody yeah. and what they represent, it's all highly aspirational. It's all- For sure. What, I tell her, let me go back to that, my own experience, Jay-Z, because I never liked Reasonable Doubt. Like it, it didn't hit me because I was a Nas fan, so I was just mm, like, oh, "This is mm. a bit right." Trying to trying to be a bit Nas in it, so yeah, yeah. But then Sean Carter Volume Three, that's when it caught me, and what it was over the years of seeing the way that he's moved 
in terms of his approach to businesses and organization and everything For else. Sure. He's also one of the greatest lyricists like of all time. Like, oh yeah, there's a couple, but Jay Z is definitely one of them, undoubtedly. Yeah. Right? Jay Z was the one um, who could balance entertainment with content all yeah. at the same time. Yeah, 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 yeah. And 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 I think with today, I mean, when you look at what. I mean, Drake's doing it. Drake is the role model for today. You can see he he inspires everyone. He inspires yeah, yeah. like any demographic, any any race, age, whatever, gender, whatever. He he taps in. He ta- he's got everybody. Like he really has. And the fascinating thing about it is, he's not even American. He's a Canadian artist, you know. Yeah, and yeah, he yeah. he's got you know he's had his own situation with his own his own with racism and, you know, being yeah. misplaced and everything. So, and I think he he's in a place where he appreciates the culture and he appreciates music and is a fan of rap. So for him, it's, a, you know, for us, it's a massive statement that he puts gigs on KMT, yeah, which is yeah. an eternal bang, a massive statement. And people are like, no US artist has ever done this for us before, but he's not US, he's Canadian. So... Yeah. That's why his approach is. But different. the culture so, resonates with him because obviously part yeah. of our lingo comes yeah, from yeah. the West Indies and that got to yeah, Canada. Yeah, 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 yeah. There's yeah. a there's a route to it, which is really interesting. Yeah. But on the flip side, they'll jump on a track with Wizkid and Skepta, which is probably one of yeah. the most progressive, forward thinking collaborations, international collaborations ever made. Like for sure. It's Af- it's it's Nigeria, um, UK and, and he's still co signing Afro African music now. Yeah, yeah, you yeah, can yeah. change it's, someone's it's not, life. Yeah, this crazy stuff lined up on the next project, which I can't yeah. talk about. But he, yeah, yeah. he's he's going to feel do free it again to talk about it. Project. I feel like we need to send you them <laughs> drinks. But we missed out the beatbox <laughs> and now the uh, yeah, the, what's the going drink on? exclusives. What's going on? <laughs> can you actually never catch me out, <laughs> dude? Could, me, Semtex, could you? No, 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 no. So are you working with Drake in some capacity, Sem? No, it's it's. You know, I've been fortunate to interview him several times. Like, mm-hmm. and you know, when he first, when he, when I knew he was coming to the UK, I, I went out my way to get in because I knew he was going to be huge. I knew he was going to be big. Yeah. So, at the time, I was on one extra at the time, and he was supposed to come on my show on Friday night. Yeah. And he didn't turn up. I was pissed. So yeah, I called. Yeah. I was like, "You can't do this." You know, I was just, like pretty much threatening them, like you can't yeah. do this. You cannot, <laughs> like don't. I was like, don't f- with me. Like I get Jeez. so he says, no, no, no. We're gonna do it the day after. We we'll do it the day after. So I was like, all right, cool. So I turned up at the hotel. He was at the Mandarin Hotel. And yeah. He's like, yo, what's going on, man? And he's like, oh, sorry, I can't make it. I was in, I was in Vienna last night. You know, like, like what? Hey, like, hey, hey, there's the way. That was the famous Rihanna moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was, was like, amazing. I understand. Like, I understand. So. And then, so we did that first interview in Hyde Park. Um, and, and yeah, it was dope. It was dope. You know, so that's, that's why I'm, I'm, I'm cool with him because, you know, I, I gave a shit before anybody else did. So, yeah, yeah. and that's, that's it matters. how I've got most of my relationships. Yeah, it's just, it's just so, being, so let's, you know. Let, let's stay on the podcast because we could do this a number of ways because I'm, I'm fascinated. Just how long have you been doing the podcast um, and what are some of the memorable moments? Um... I did I did my very first podcast, right, back in 2008, where I was, and the reason why I did it was, so I was on radio, and I was like, I was like, I always felt they never appreciated what I brought to the table when I was at the BBC, because I was like, I'm doing all this great stuff, but you, you ain't you ain't tapping in the way that you should be kind of thing. Which, And then I learned over time, that's how it is. You just got to get on and do your thing. It doesn't matter whether right. yeah. an organization gets involved or behind you or not, just do it because yeah. someone's going to come to the table. Especially you know, now. So, oh yeah, yeah, definitely now. So, so I was at South by Southwest and I was working with an artist called Mr. Hudson who had signed and we introduced him to Kanye West and Kanye was working on the project. So, I was back and forth to the States all the time with the good music camp and everything else. So I was backstage at South by Southwest at the Fader Fort when there was a good music event. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I, everyone's here. I was like, I've got access to everyone. So it was just me backstage by myself with a microphone. So I just started interviewing everyone. And then I was like, 
oh, I'm going to do a podcast because I've heard about these things. So I was yeah, like, oh, yeah. I'm going to do that because there's right. a way for me to put it out. I did the artwork myself, everything else, edited it myself, recorded, produced everything, put it out there. And it was dope. It was just like, you know, I did that. And then what happened was when 2015, yeah, I left it alone then in 2015 and whatnot when I started doing the groundwork for the book. I was like, I got, I got great conversations. I was like, it's just getting wasted. And it, yeah. it wasn't really appropriate for radio. So I was like, I'm going to start this podcast. So I did, I did the Hip Hop Raising Me podcast from then. It was, um, and I was talking to like Coach K who runs QC or Stormzy or whoever or whoever. Mm-hmm. So I find every conversation valuable. I find yeah. that I think these podcasts um, document moments in time. And I think it's things that resonate i feel like i've got a duty to document the culture and even just talking like you know i always want to know how they do things and whatever 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 and that and that's pretty much how it came about so i was doing that then the book came out then i got approached by spotify to do the who we be podcast and i was like cool did the first season did the second season then they wanted to switch it for the third season and do they wanted to do like a magazine type thing and do stuff yeah, like from clubs. And I, was like, now, I don't want to do it. Yeah, I was like, I don't want to. I do loved that. your Who so We Be podcast. Yeah, they yeah. were amazing. So we went, we went our separate ways. It was all good. It was there's no beef or anything like that. We great time working together. So this is the Hip Hop Raise Me podcast, yeah. and that's that's what I'm doing moving forward. Who, who's your most popular uh, guest in your mind? Or, or and I, I think of that from a point of like, who do you like? Uh, to interview because you found it just a rewarding interview. Uh, you know, was it instructive or, or you felt like it was powerful or whatever? I'm not saying it broke news, but like, was there one that just stands out? There's a lot. There's a lot that stand out. I think I've had, I mean, across the, not just with the podcast, but doing interviews in general. Like, I've yeah. done over a thousand interviews with different artists. So I've interviewed Jay Z several times, always inspiring. You always learn yeah. something from him because. The way the way Jay Z talks is like he's like that wise guy. He's like that not not in the Italian gangster type yeah, sense yeah. in the film. Oh, I know. Yeah, he comes out with you know, for instance, and he gives it like the last time I did an interview. He's like, oh, we meet again. I was like, yeah, was, how are you doing? Because it we must be doing something right, right? You know, like it, it's like it's so, very yeah. down to earth. You know what I mean? And it's like, yeah, it is true. We're definitely doing something right, like to be able to hook up and still talk. So. Any time with Jay Z, Kanye West is, I think, he's one of the greatest artists ever. I think he, he is just generations Wolfgang Amadeus, mm. um, in the sense that his music and his art will transcend centuries. I really do believe yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, um, I agree. Drake, again, he he's a guy who is on top of the world and has been since he came out. He's just tapped in. He knows how to do it. He knows how to work. I don't know if it's because he came from acting in the beginning. I don't know if it's because he's just got a very, very savvy team behind him, but mm. he's a very dope, progressive, successful artist. There's not many people that think about them words, progressive and successful. There's, there's not many no. that you can say that. For sure. Know? There's a couple. For sure. Why, yeah. why doesn't Drake get, you know, for everything that Drake's achieved, he just doesn't, I feel like he doesn't get the flowers that surmount to everything that he's achieved and what he's done for the genre. I think I think I think it, there's a couple of reasons, and I do feel like there's a couple of reasons for that. My 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 theory is the timeline dictates everything right now, right? Yeah. So whether it's Instagram, Twitter, because it's really funny, like TikTok's popping as an app. Yeah. I'm, I don't. No one really understands the timeline yet. Like no yeah. one. It's it's a different way of doing things. But right now on social media. The Instagram timeline and the Twitter timeline crowds and dictates everything. There's a lot of um, uninformed opinions that get promoted on there. Um, and in the same way, you know, you got the fake news and the propaganda that went through Facebook, which is a mu- much more insidious. I think with Instagram and Twitter, um, the most uneducated fans can throw out the most ignorant comment and it'll get traction. And I think that overweighs the negative shit, overweighs the positive shit. And I think most people don't get the flowers until they're dead. They don't get them until it's they're falling off. Or, yeah. 
I've got a question that off the back of um, <clears throat> what you're saying about social media and music and the commercialization of hip hop as a genre where you know where we're talking about what would people consider the golden era of hip hop right the early 90s and then how it's progressed over the years from being political to being about entertainment and it goes through trends right and mm. i think nowadays where you've got social media it almost allows you to have like a rap cheat code you know what i mean there's a certain mm. archetype to a rapper now that that it's uh, obviously for someone to go on to have drake success and all that kind of stuff is is it takes years of 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 work and refinement and something innate right but where now with social media you've kind of got these um this cheat codes and you can all of a sudden look like a rapper you say the right things you mention the right gangs you mention the right stuff all of a sudden you're you've got a song one artist mm. that springs to mind is like cj yeah you know yeah. It, it, the, how do you think that affects the future of rap because it's just dilution you get me and that's what you're saying where so many people can have an opinion it, it kind of fragments what perhaps is authentic about it do you know what i mean and then mm. you just get a lot of noise of people that perhaps are you know devaluing it do you know what i mean I, I think that problem has always been there with or without social media because i think of every genre you'll have two or three you, you get let's say we get three hyper successful acts and then there'll be a bit of a scene or there will be a scene or a culture yeah. and, be, and be it rock music be it jazz be it any other genre there is always shit. there is always clones there's always people that have been trying to tap in and cash in so you know with uh, what you're saying about the golden era of hip-hop it was happening then it's just it was so shit, you've forgotten about it and what artists were do, uh, doing stuff like that back then because obviously i only know about the big ones at the end of it isn't it well that's what i'm saying there's there's there's, there's so many one of things that came out and they just didn't make it for whatever reason and i, yeah. I don't, I don't want to say that because you know like again this will go out i could name an artist <laughs> Give us and they'll the be smoke. like oh, this, this, <laughs> no but it's an opinion at the end of the day no but it's it's all it's a creative object i think you can speak about music objectively and say yeah do you know what that for sure you I can but it, you, you can but if if i name names it, the smoke comes back one way or the other. Like it could be a year later. Oh, you said this about me in this podcast, and then it's like, you know what I mean? And I, I got to, you know, apologize or whatever. Yeah, Sorry yeah, for yeah. speaking my mind. Da, 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 da. But it, it, it's, it's happened. And going back to the CJ thing as an example. All right, so track Whoopty, it's tapping into the whole BK drill thing, which is a byproduct of UK drill, which is a byproduct of Chicago, Chicago drill. Chicago, yeah. So it's it's all the evolution, right? It's is and, and and it's amazing what's going on in Ghana right now with Ghanaian drill and Australia with Australian drill. It's it's fascinating how the sound and the cultures going one way and then giving back yeah. and then going another way and then being influenced and da 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 da. It's it's crazy time. Where is M in this? Because I, I, M and M. Who's your, yeah? Who's your yeah? Who's your lyrical genius? In hip hop, into or who's your who do you think's the most couple of talented rappers in, in in the world or the history of hip hop? And where does M feature in this? Because I'm he's my he's my I love Jay Z as well, but he's my hero. Um, okay, it, I'd say off the top of my head, Jay Z and Andre 3000. I think I think Eminem's dope, incredible, right? Like you know, the Slim Shady album, genre defining. I love yeah. the monster track that he did with Juice World. Flows on it insane, yeah. but he kind of does the same thing. Yeah, yeah. He kind of has the same tone, the same content, and the same. It doesn't work outside of being angry at his baby mother and frustrated <laughs> about raising his daughter. And whereas with Jay Z, he's done so many different styles, so many different things. Technically, one of the greatest, if not the greatest. But the breadth of what he's done from straight up street rap to what he's done with um, Rihanna or Beyonce, or he takes it somewhere else. And then what he means to society, how he affects popular culture, it is way more diverse in terms of his ability and what he does. Could you say that about both of them career-wise? No, it's not the same thing. And then I think with Andre 3000, he is 
he is one of the most creative um, lyricists ever because what he did with Outkast, what he did with the Love Below album, I just, I just think he he could have gone so much further if he wanted to, but he felt like he'd done what he'd done, you know. And going back to what we we're saying about clones, there's been a lot of attempted Andre 3000 yeah. clones. Never the same. Do you it's think never Eminem same. holds this darling in culture? And here's a, a straight question: Do you think it's because he's white? Okay, here's the thing: Eminem in 2021. I don't know if it's aged well because the stuff that is said about women, I don't know. I don't know. I it's don't a know. lot. It's, not... it's a lot. Here's, here's yeah. another thing. Monster, right? What he does with the flow. As a fan of that, yeah, I think it's incredible. This generation, what what is he doing? I yeah. can't even understand yeah. what he's saying. Like, yeah. they don't value his ability, his technical ability, but oh, I don't understand what he's saying. It's a bit sh- you know mm. what I mean? It's like, mm. that's what I'm saying. Has it stood the test of time? It's like, and that's the thing. You've got to know when to switch it up. And and I think every generation changes. Mm. It will probably come back around where people appreciate the technical thing again more at some point. But I just, I don't, I've never, I've never thought he was the main guy like that. I think he's dope, undeniably dope. But. And, and he's had a lot of questionable albums. A lot. He's had way more questionable albums than he has good albums. Like if we're being honest. Yeah, you know? yeah. Uh, and yet, and yet, he's sold more than any hip hop artist. Right? But that's Ever. what I'm saying. Do you think he's? Do you think that's I mean, because yeah, he's white? That I think. I think. I think. Yeah. And that's that's. But what within that? What that means is he's opened the doors to a wider audience for the culture. Mm. Like the existence of Eminem got more people into hip hop. I think it made people who look like him, who maybe hadn't been into it before, understand it and get into it more and and open them doors. So someone was always going to do it because of the invisible hip hop rule book. Mm. Like there was a few white rappers that came before that never really cut through in the same way. And they never had the benefit of the rap privilege of Dr. Dre. They never had the cosign from someone as significant. So yeah. it was only after that that people started to be more confident in signing white rappers and being, well, actually, they can exist. The problem that white rappers have got now is everyone gets compared to Eminem. Yeah. You know, yeah, like, yeah. you see if labels, it's the new Eminem. <laughs> you know? yeah. And you know whenever a label says, it's the new Eminem, yeah. you're f***ed. You're done. <laughs> the problem just, yeah. Because everyone just says, no, he's not. Yeah, 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 yeah. it's true. I, 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 lazy I, I, analogy, though. That... Can we do this? Given we're coming to the end of the podcast with so many more questions, it's been so much fun. Let's uh, shift gears um, and, and, and just talk about, if you think about music on, on culture, and obviously we're, we're, this is all about hip hop, but, you know, I don't know, social economic issues, race, discrimination, police brutality, the list goes on, family values. It's all been discussed, right? If you think about, and you started to answer this right in the beginning, but what is the one thing hip hop's taught you? Um, if, if you think like, like, if you could, if you could narrow it down, or maybe give yourself one or two, believe in yourself. Mm. Boom, that's it. Because you believe in yourself, everything unlocks. You believe in yourself, you can accomplish anything. I love it. If 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 you want to run for prime minister, do it. You yeah. believe in yourself to get yourself educated to get to the point and play that game. That political game is shiesty. It's it's worse than the drug game. It's worse than the music industry. But if you want to do that, you could do that. Yeah, dark yeah. arts, all of that. And then if you wanted to be a financer, yeah, do it. And that's it. But you've got to have that self-belief. You can't do anything without believing in yourself. If you don't believe in yourself, how are you going to stand on stage in front of 20,000 people and rock it? Yeah. <laughs> you ain't going to do it with authenticity. To Ch- say that no other genre can give that message in that way, that directly good question i can't answer that because i'm not educated enough in other genres and you know i think people talk people love to like use the analogy of punk even though it's a genre that existed for two years and everything else and all of that and and, and, punk ain't about like that now like punk has i get what you're saying because sometimes i'll describe something as let's be punk about it but i'll yeah like hip-hop is is still here as you're saying about it's not heritage it's still going Mm. i mean it's still growing yeah and and 
and uh, you know other genres I don't know enough I'd say no but I'd be ignorant to say that because I haven't seen anyone talk about it as passionately I haven't seen anyone talk about other genres um in the same way you know I know there's people that will celebrate pivotal moments or pivotal acts I know but but I do I mean I spend a lot of time at the moment watching live shows from James Brown and Prince because yeah the detail and the dynamics of what they do on stage is like James Brown is a show that please I, I everybody should check this out when he was in you just google it James Brown France there's a show that he did in Paris Mm-hmm. And it's fascinating to see how it's just him, a band and dancers, and everybody knows their part, like everything to a T. So mm-hmm. he'll he'll come on and then the crowd's cheering and everything else. He'll start singing. He'll go from a slow ballad to a hyped up funk track. He'll improvise on the song. He'll have his dancers dancing to the right of him. And then all of a sudden they'll get in with the dance routine perfectly, flawlessly yeah, yeah. doing the exact same moves as the dance routine. And then the dancers carry on. Everybody knows their part within the band. Everybody knows their part, whether they're backing singers or whether they're dancers. And then another track, he'll just jump on the drum kit. It's the way he controls the crowd with body language and a few utterances. Um, that showmanship exists today. There's nobody doing that. Really, yeah. and I think that's a massive. It's a shame, and the reason why it doesn't exist is because of how much it would cost to do that. How much it would cost to keep a band together that tight? Like, if that was to happen now, the drummer would be like doing all other things of other acts or whatever. Or people would rely on special effects and the big ten-minute show before you go on and all. But that also, bullshit. you don't right, need the right. shows now to break an act. You break via your records. So the people have become amazing yeah. studio people. Do you know what I mean? Whereas they don't. The honing your craft yeah. like that is a secondary thing. Do you know what I mean? Still, yeah, but but still that that quest for creative perfection, like at the live show and the music. The music sounds exactly the same as what it does on the record. The drums are tuned exactly the same as what they do on tracks that you hear that sample those drums. So it's like every attention to detail has been made. There's a guy that comes out, there's an MC that comes out and says it's star time and they're going to start the show and da 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 da. The presentation, the start, the beginning, the end, flawless. And, and, and I think. I think that's very, very much missing. I don't even know why I got yeah. to this point, but just, just watch that video. It's well, incredible. Same with Prince as well. Incredible. I'm going to say something on this that, that really always pissed me off about live performances, and that's that if you're going to do a track that, that, that everyone knows and your audience loves, either do it like it sounds on the record, or it better be so f- good you're going to do a different version of it all right but if you do something in the middle it's quicksand right it's quicksand because it's neither defining anything and it's not the thing they heard before right uh Jax, i got a question for you in your genre what's the one thing that's taught you oi the thing is i approach dance music uh like rap and i actually find it tricky because i grew up on black music you know everything from blues to r&b to rap you know that was what my my stepdad was nigerian he would collect records and that's what he was playing in the house so that was my appetite and dance music is a very different world it, 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 you know mm. the economic aspects that we explore in rap is frowned upon in dance music it's all about hedonism and uh uh you know there is expression and there's resistance in there i would say it's watered down a bit now but the you know for me sometimes i find that challenging so my journey within what i do is bringing my lessons from rap into what i do and trying to put some of those ideas into dance and not being ashamed of it do you know what i mean that's oh, what man. i'm taking and i find resistance in that sometimes it feels weird some but I, through that i found my authenticity do you know what i mean where yeah. exactly what you said uh earlier in the conversation where you just got to do it. And sometimes it's not about an institution embracing you. You just got to put it out there and put product out there. And if you believe in it, someone's going to like it. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think I think everything else follows. I think at the end of the day, you've just got to believe in yourself, make sure the bangs and it'll follow. Like the For follow sure. ring. 
the fans, you'll you'll develop fans, like, and everything else falls into place. All that other stuff, it's just like, it's just whatever, man. It's just yeah, man. It's, yeah. With, without 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 that sense of belief in yourself and conviction, and without the art, which is the oil, nothing's moving. If you haven't got them two things, you, it doesn't exist. Yeah. Well, I hope we can reconvene in a few years' time and have another lengthy conversation, and and we can start the conversation saying, "Well, we must be doing something right." <laughs> yeah, man, we, we we should we should do this every so often, man. This is good. This is great. Like, I like this. Like, yeah, this is the end of year catch up or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. I've I mean, loved, I loved it. it. Yeah, this, thank this you. This is a so lot of fun. I think it's my favorite <laughs> interview. <laughs>